I'm Yan Jun Chi. I'm from University of Virginia Department of Computer Science. So today I'm going to talk about um, joint learning of rela uh, multiple related sparse Gaussian graphical models from heterogeneous samples. So you can tell I use Beamer to make the presentations. And I guess you know what that means. So um, this is a roadmap. It's pretty scary, but honestly, I just so uh, to give you a little bit of background about why I'm doing so is, so initially I want to use my uh, ICML and uh, AI stats presentation for this crowd. Then based on last uh, yesterday's presentations, I realized no, that will not work. And the topic is kind of largely different from all the presentations you have covered. So all presentation you had before centered around a uh, um, biological tasks. But here, what I'm doing is centered around a computational modeling. So I added a lot of uh, background slides and the reason why. So I hope this makes the whole presentation a little bit accessible and then that also makes it really, really long. Uh, but I'm going to skip, to be honest, I'm going to skip all those detailed method um, details or uh, optimization choices, uh, I will only just put the bigger ideas and bigger, uh, all like theoretical results, uh, only just roughly. So uh, the focus will be about why and the motivations uh, behind all the designs. So uh, I wish uh, you're not too tired from your uh, lunch and then this equation intensive uh, presentation or tutorial can at least uh, open uh, some doors to some um, like more advanced computational tools. Okay, so uh, to start, so uh, the first thing I want to cover is actually not about joint sparse uh, graphical models. It's about Deep Chrome. Deep Chrome is the tutorial talk I gave last year. And it's really about my naive understanding of biology. So I have to confess, I'm a pure computer scientist trained, um, trained researcher work on computational biology. My understanding of biology, it's always just this slide. And I'm thinking from a computer, computer software perspective to think about biological system. I want to modulize. I want to design computer modules to represent each of the biological modules. This is more like a philosophy of a lot of work we have done before, uh, especially all those work we finished in Deep Chrome um, in this um, direction of deepchrome.org. So uh, this slide is always for my computer science conferences, so big data uh, in biology, and I have to convince them truly big data in biology. So just use the circles here to, to show how large genomic data compared to YouTube, Twitter, all those data you normally think they are big data. Genomic data are even larger. So I don't need to convince you apparently. So before I going on to the tools I'm designing and all I designed, I want to share you about the research philosophies my group have and for quite a long time. So what I think about um, how to position myself, like just to echo Kurt Morris about how do you position yourself as a computer scientist or statisticians when you're inside biology and or you think yourself on inside computer science. So for me, I still um, think my goal uh, is to build tools, to build great softwares, very, very well engineered softwares that is can model the biology and can also provide biology uh, explanations. So that's about domain knowledge. We need to have softwares to model the biology and also provide uh, explanations to biologists. And so that's the two sides of the, are more like a bracket. But we need the features of the software we build. 
and this is about um, more like a Go. So I want to build software or machine learning software that is explainable, scalable, accurate, and robust. So this is the three, four features we try to keep in mind in every project we are trying to do. So this connects to uh, the Deep Chrome, and we are trying to, um, like I said, as a computer scientist, I'm using the modular, module uh, thinking to think about how to model biology, especially the data-driven um, bioinformatics modules, because this really gives our OA use data to recover those modules using machine learning to cover those biological modules. So you can tell each one of them, hopefully, the data here to there, we can use a module. So you can tell this is from deep learning modules because they are easily more, easy, uh, more easily composable. So uh, this is a timeline I, uh, we work on. We use deep learning work on biological tasks. So there are also some string kernel before. So honestly, we find recently it's very, very hard. So we can do each module at a time, like sequences to transcription factor binding or histone modification to expression output. But it's really, really hard to achieve this, this goal. It's from the pipeline, from the sequence input to the end, just like we think about biology in one slide. So um, if you know the trick or know about what's going on, uh, just feel free to share, and we, we can just discuss um, offline. And the reason it's hard, uh, it just, I guess it's the input size. And also there are a lot of things, a lot of things hard for the current deep, uh, deep learning models to model. For example, SNP data. So if you only just input the sequence, uh, the frequencies, I feel like you lose the, um, you lose the, uh, the sequence information. So, uh, so in the end, but this is not the main topic, but it's a one major uh, research focus in my group. And we aim for, again, so even though we are using deep learning, our research aim is the same. Uh, it's explainable and uh, fast and accurate. So this is a website I want to share. So we are maintaining a website called deep to read and uh, this is a collective of a lot of papers. So each student to uh, have a Beamer slide cover a paper we chose in, uh, from a lot of uh, like reading group sessions and plus two seminars. I organized like 10 or 20 students to cover about 100 papers per semester. So it, quite a lot of papers. And because the taste, you know, I'm interested in biology, so a lot of method I picked there is about sequence input or graph input or sequence output or graph output, which I think maybe uh, it's useful for this crowd. So feel free to check it out. Okay, just to check, is my voice kind of scattering or pretty consistent? Good. Okay, so now let's come to uh, something called joinnets.org, which is the focus of my uh, second research thrust. So I'm, I use like a GitHub blog site to summarize each one of my research focus just to give a continuous explanation and hopefully a better looking of to summarize our work. So, okay. So for the joinnets.org, our focus is to looking for interactions among important biological entities. So for example, we are interested in protein-protein interactions. We are interested in gene-gene interactions. We are interested in neural region and neural region interactions. But here, it's not physical interactions. What we want to recover or infer is from observed observe the signals of proteins, many proteins, observe signals of many genes, observe signals of neuron regions, uh, brain regions. So the primary tool we are using to do this is graphical models. And 
the graphical model is a very well um, kind of principled methodology in machine learning. We have made a lot of extension to extend it to estimate multiple graphs because we think heterogeneous samples are a very big, um, it's, um, it's a very important problem in biology. So our design of novel approach is motivated by our interest in biology. So honestly, the, uh, the time I started the project is when ENCODE and ROADMAP kind of released all those data about multi-cell data. So this gives us a, a chance to think about um, this is a valuable uh, direction to continue uh, to extend sparse graphical models. So also echo code Morris, um, how to figure out a niche as a computer scientist or machine learning person, it's relatively hard. So the goal uh, kind of echo our research philosophy is we want to design joint graph discovery from heterogeneous samples. We want our estimator uh, accurate and scalable. We use a lot of parallelization considerations because I think this is one of the really big advantage in the modern computer architecture. And we want to achieve sharp convergence rate. So I'm, I will cover what do I mean sharp convergence rate? What do I mean scalable tools? What do I mean accurate tools? So uh, again, so this project, we don't cover trustworthy perspective at all. So in terms of trustworthy, it's normally about like privacy or security, which is the third research direction we, we're, uh, we work on, uh, but not about this. Okay, so this is the timeline of the work uh, in this direction. So all of the paper different from Deep Chrome, uh, our Deep Chrome papers, um, yeah, if you can tell, for Deep Chrome work, we cover, we publish almost half-half, half in the machine learning places, half in uh, compile. Um, but for uh, join nets dot, all the join nets work, they're mostly in, in uh, machine learning uh, venues. And I hope this presentation or this tutorial can help me open the door that um, maybe some of you figure out you can you have a perfect perfect application for our tools because I really like I confess my understanding of biology is quite naive I need people to help me okay so uh, just to uh, continue what I meant uh, our research philosophy right what do we mean a accurate and scalable tools. So, you know, in a discriminated setting, in a supervised setting, you can normally use the predictions, prediction to, you predicted uh, predictions versus the true, and to measure the error. That's how we normally do, like our, um, the regression error, if you're doing regression, this uh, expression classification output, but if your task is more like um, more theoretically uh, speaking, what do you mean it's an accurate estimator or accurate um, uh, training, mod uh, training model? Um, so here we use a very important uh, concept it's called statistical convergence rate. And who has learned about statistical convergence rate? Please raise your hand. Okay, so, so theoretically, this means uh, just roughly. Um, I have a lot of abusing of terminologies in this presentation just to make it more accessible. It's about how close is your estimation to the truth. Just memorize that. It's, very, it's just enough. And in terms of speed, I meant I want to build scalable tools, right? And that means I want to have fast and efficient tools. But how do you measure fast or efficiencies? There are two different kinds of uh, metrics. The first is about optimization. It's called optimization convergence rate. The second is called computational complexity. 
So this all sounds so ancient, right? Let's go to this figure. It's very easy, actually very, very intuitive. What I meant, statistical convergence read is, when you do an estimation, you got an estimated parameter, like for example, in your linear regression model or Lasso model, you got a W, that's your estimated W from the data, but there's a truth on the line. How close is that stopping, is the stop point of your optimization to the truth? That's the stati statistical convergence rate. That's it. And you know, the iterative optimization method, you normally start from something like this rabbit trying to reach the goal, right? And in, if you're using an iterative, like for example, stochastic gradient descent or gradient descent, you have multiple iterations. Each iteration, how fast each iteration close to that end point versus the previous iteration, the you can think about is the length, um, actually reverse length of this bar. That means one hop. What's the hop? What's the hop size is the optimization convergence rate. The further you hop close to the end point, the faster is your convergence, optimization convergence rate. Of course, I want to have the best hop is what? Starting from the start, one hop, I reach the end point. Who can tell me what is um, this type of estimator? Do you have some kind of estimator like this? From the starting point, one hop, you're reaching the end. Yes, linear regression model, the normal equation-based linear regression solution is the one-hop solution, which we normally call them closed-form solution. And all the other solution using iterative gradient descent, there you have to consider the hop, the hop size, the hop size decides how many hops, that how many hops is the iteration you need to achieve that estimation. So if you're using deep learning, how do you know when do I stop? An epox. Do you normally just do empirical? Actually, yeah, we normally do empirical, but there are actually asymptotic differences with different optimization methods, how fast they converge. And yeah, so this is a very big topic about convergence rate, optimization convergence rate, especially very, very um, kind of uh, popular and uh, in deep learning. So, and then there's another rate called time complexity. Time com complexity is actually running time cost. So this is very computer science, it's more like algorithmic complexity. So I have explanations, so just to standardize whatever we talk about. So I assume we are given a sample matrix X with size n times p. n means number of samples, p means number of variables. Um, so we're going to assume the Gaussian distribution on top of this x uh, variable, uh, x, um, all the x vector, and the covariance is represented as a sigma, and precision matrix is represented as omega. So I will talk about what the, what do I mean like later. So again, so statistical convergence rate to recap, how close is between your estimated parameter and the true parameter? It's all, some, sometimes we also call that error bonds. It's about approximation error or estimation error. Error bonds, it's more intuitive um, to memorize. So computational complexity means how fast and how efficient your algorithm is respect to certain parameters. So I have more slides about later and the optimization convergence rate, I already talked about it. And there are famous linear convergence rates, superlinear, sublinear, quadratic, cubic. So there are a lot of variation in the optimization domain about their convergence rate. Okay, so uh, just to recap, 
optimization, convergence rate is about a hop. Time complexity is about running time cost of the whole jump. And the stopping point versus the truth is about statistical convergence rate. In parameter wise, you actually can estimate uh, estimating a lot of uh, estimators uh, statistical convergence rate. What we normally, what we mean to statistical uh, convergence rate is to derive this. So theta is your parameter to estimate. Theta star is the truth. You're trying to get maybe L1 norm or L uh, Fubinus norm if that's a matrix case or a L2 norm. So normally you can, more generic formulation is a norm function with regard to the differences of the estimated to the truth. So this is extremely important for the high dimensional setting. So honestly, I think most of you are working on high dimensional tasks. In the case, you have more features than samples. But I guess the UK Biobank actually changed the paradigm. Uh, now you have more samples than more features. <laughs> but if you consider heterogeneity, you still have, it's still high dimensional uh, situations. So that's convergence, statistical convergence rate, because I don't want you to feel too sleepy, so I keep uh, using this figure again and again. And um, so optimization convergence rate, uh, like, like, like I just said, closed form solution is from the starting point, you have one hop, you reach the estimated parameter. This is called closed form solutions. <coughs> closed form solution, so for the same task, closed form solutions are faster than cubic, uh, then optimization with cubic convergence rate, then faster than uh, quadratic convergence rate, then faster than linear convergence rate. Mostly what you're using now is linear convergence rate. Uh, it's gradient descent is a linear convergent, uh, with a linear convergence rate. Depends on the function, there's also superlinear, sublinear, but we're not going to cover that. Again, so optimization convergence rate is the hop size, that hop size, one hop size. And then computational complexity is we use big O notations. So computational complexity means the amount of resource you need to use to run the algorithm. What I mean, the amount of resource can be running time can also be memory cost. So in the figure, what I showed, um, it's actually uh, the running time cost. So how do you do the calculation of this? So, you know, if you're using an iterative algorithm to solve, to estimate parameter from your data, um, each step, you can actually estimate each hops running cost, and then that number of hops you need is related to the convergence rate of this optimization. Let's assume it's T. And then you can calculate the time cost, actually the time co running time cost of this optimization through T times each hop. And then the most important is what is the each hop computational cost, right? So we normally actually, we actually know a lot of uh, operations computational cost. I hope you learned it from um, numerical optimization class or your data structure class. For example, matrix multiplication, the, uh, it's NP quadratic. Time cost, they're actually better, they, they are the state of the art solutions it's actually better than this, but this is a good um, representation of its cost. And the matrix inversion is P cubic. SVD is P cubic. And uh, self-thresholding, because self-thresholding is a very important operator when you do sparse um, high dimensional models. 
the if you do soft thresholding of a matrix, the cost is O P quadratic. So um, I'm in the later I'm going to explain why do I need to bother by this? Why do this even matter? So it matters a lot. So questions? Okay. Uh, again, so and to Still pulling to the end the statistical convergence rate, the whole thing running time cost and optimization convergence rate. Okay, I think you now you get it. Okay, so now let's talk about the task. So um, in many applications, uh, we want to know the interaction among the variables. Like, for example, Jinjin uh, interactions, user user interactions, or um, brain region and another region functional interactions. So, there, uh, um, of course, the reason why we want to understand it, it, it why we want to know it, is because it provides um, a good understanding of the underlying mechanism. It uh, can be used to design, uh, to figure out a marker if there are two different contexts, in normal versus maybe a disease stage. Maybe because of the pairwise interaction is the factor to make the disease um, happen versus the normal. So there are a lot of work in the literature about using, trying to estimate interactions among variables. So why, uh, you know, there are so many work about correlation. Correlation matrix. So, but in this work, we do conditional dependency uh, graph. The reason is it's actually about this uh, very simple examples. So, if a one variable it's about the uh, children uh, swim, uh, like, like this, the distribution of maybe histogram of how many children uh, are swimming in a certain maybe lake. And a two variable is the weather is hot. A three variable is there's a very good high sale of ice creams. And a four is you wear less amount of clothes. A five is about high electricity cost uh, consumption. If you do correlation, you measure, you actually measure each variables across, okay, many, maybe, um, many timestamp or uh, many regions, you do correlation. You're going to get a full matrix, a full matrix all correlated with each other. So if you convert this into a graph view and every variables interact with or dependent with another variable. Question here? Okay. If you, we, we don't do correlation, we actually do conditional dependencies. The graph we're going to get is this much sparse graph, which is A2 is the hot weather. Because A2 is the hot weather, it actually is related to all the other variables. All the other variables, when conditional on A2, they are conditional, conditionally independent of each other. So this is the graph I'm looking for. Questions? Just, I feel this is more, you know. No? So, um, I mean, so you can see that the one on the right is like part of the correlation graph. Yes, totally true. Like yes. So, um, I have a slide actually later talk about this. Um, um, yeah, so wait for that slide. So in the end, um, our task is we want to have observed samples from those observed samples about each variables, about multiple variables, we want to estimate a conditional dependency graph. And the task is pretty easy, right? You have n observed samples. Each sample is a snapshot of all the variables, all the p variables. And each sample is a measurement of that p variables. And when n larger than p, and this is 
can. So if you have a good um, like graphical model case, the end data samples are good enough to have a very good estimator um, through very simple operations. However, for p larger than n case, we need to design smarter, uh, more regular regularize a model to estimate the graph. Okay, this page is the concept behind, behind sparse Gaussian graphical models. I know this is so scary. Um, so we have a two, uh, oh God. So this is probability. So this bullet here is about probability, joint probability. So, um, not sure if your you know your entry probability class teachers taught you about. So if you want to understand probabilistic models, only three things: joint probability, marginal probability, conditional probability. Remember that. If you just memorize every complicated probabilistic modeling, it's about that three. And not everything, all the techniques behind it's about the three. Okay, so we have a series of tu uh, tutorials about um, all those things uh, in our joinness.org. So I don't have time to cover here, but just roughly the conditional dependency in the end is trying to model joint probability of x1 to xp. And it's related to graphical model. It's just actually we're using graphic model as a tool to model the joint probability. In graphical models, there are two tasks. When you have the graph, you want to infer, so like I just said, right? When you have the graph, you want to infer joint probability, marginal probability, conditional <laughs> probability. But there's another task. You don't have the graph. You have only the data. You want to infer the graph. That task is called structure learning. And specifically what we focus on here, and also um, most people focus on, is to do structural learning uh, for a marker random field. And even um, simpler, our work is focused on Gaussian graphical models. So there's a reason for Gaussian graphical models is the Gaussian graphical model is partial correlation um, sparse structure actually corresponded to its conditional dependency uh, graphs. So I'm not going to talk about it, but there's actually a tutorial we made to connect the two. So on the equation level, you can derive it. And also why the conver covariance matrix, so, so this is something still pretty uh, hard to memorize for the student who never learned about it, but just kind of roughly get it. So uh, Gaussian graphical model, and in this high dimensional case, we need to add in the sparse regularization. So that's why it's called a sparse Gaussian graphical model, to just to regularize, to get more uh, asymptotically uh, better estimation. And the, there's a superset of Gaussian graphical model called non-paranormal uh, graphical models. You can do very easy extension of Gaussian graphic models to this non paranormal graphic model. And we focus on the task, structure learning. There are two different tasks when you work on graphical models. Uh, probability to inference, just like I said, infer joint marginal conditional probability when given a graph. And another task is when given a data, you want to infer the graph. So this, uh, our work focus on data to graph. Good. So we're count. Sure. Does that include the probability that you do around the graph? Good question. Um, so for the graphical model case, um, yes, you can estimate sigma and omega, right? Omega, um, yes, you can. Yeah, we, we do that. Yeah. But, yeah. Okay. So uh, I think I'm using a lot of time, is it? Oh, gosh. Uh, 
Okay, so I'm going to only finish the test because all those estimators, after I finish about why, you're going to understand it. So when we do sparse um, Gaussian graphic models, we have one data. We assume that data is from Gaussian, one Gaussian distribution, and we derive the graph. But in biology, we have all those related contexts generate related data matrices. And that kind of motivates us to extend single task sparse Gaussian graphic model to multi task sparse Gaussian graphic model. So rather than just kind of concatenate all those samples into one big matrices and we just think them as um, multiple matrices, we estimate multiple graphs. And the specific task we think um, kind of valuable here is if there are multiple diseases, this disease agnostic in, uh, interactions, it's good thing you know, to estimate at what we mean commonality among graphs. When you, you know, the context about normal versus disease state, then that means the differences among the graph is something very interesting um, to estimate. So, um, for example, if you do use um, transcription factor binding interactions, maybe across, in, maybe uh, in INCO, you have many cell types, like normal, leukemia, stem. So there are shared interactions. We can think about there are more like housekeeping interactions. There are also individual interactions. There are more uh, cell type specific. And uh, so that's our first task. The second task is beyond the samples. So like I said, structure learning is from sample to graph, right? But there's so many additional knowledge you actually know beyond the sample itself. For example, you know, I mean, there's multiple genes are in one pathway, the spatial um, locations among brain regions. How can you add those informations into the structure learning of related graphs and also difference graphs? So the third task is uh, called difference graph. So there's a lot of notations and then about our philosophy. And OK, so now it comes to why do I care about computational cost? So first of all, P is very large. So for example, in each case, there are 6,000 genes. Human K, 30,000. Um, ah, uh, yeah. So if you do word-word interaction, that's even more. And also about context, about, you know, you can do with normal versus disease state, their K equal only equal to two. The number of heterogeneity contact you consider is only two. But if you move to the modern biology databases, there are all those many, many different type of cell types. Like for example, we use one of the data, data from ENCODE, K equals to 91. Okay, so the state-of-the-art estimator, it's called GGL, uh, one's called Joint Graphical Lasso, and this is its computational cost, cost per iteration. The bottleneck is SVD operation. There's another uh, per, uh, estimator called WCMU, its cost is k to the power of 4 times p power of 5. There's also in the difference um, um, for the task. So this is for the first task, doing a joint estimation. This is the second task, adding the knowledge. And this is for the third task, estimating the differences across two contexts. Uh, so this is not very correct. So it's 4K to the 2, actually, for the last one, because you only care about two contexts. And when you have P equals to 30K features, your cost is one hour per iteration. And for uh, another method, uh, it considered this additional knowledge, but um, it's extremely slow through a linear programming formulation. It needs, like, there's never, it, it never going to end, just to give you a rough, uh, estimation, and there's JGL, this joint graphical lasso, takes 3.5 days per iteration. If we consider, because this is only one hop, right? When you consider multiple hops, because that multiple hops is about convergence rate, and then you're going to know how long each estimation truly needs. 
So this is the reason why we care about computational cost. So um, again, at the same time, we should also do, um, so that's why our one of the major philosophy in our work is to make scalable, um, scalable models that can scale up to larger P. And at the same time, no sacrifice of the asymptotic cost, which is that end step. So even though we're doing large scale estimation, our last estimation is still very close to the truth. So this is our design philosophy. Okay, so, so everything is um, because I have too many slides. I think I'm going to skip Gaussian graphical models. So uh, the joint graphical lasso is a mark marker, uh, it's maximal likelihood estimation. The whole point is using a uh, second norm to push the graph to be related. And for example, there's a fuse norm is to trying to minimize the differences among graphs. So this is one of the norm, you can use norm. So if you look at this formulation, the first row is the data likelihood from Gaussian distribution. The second, the first norm is I want to each graph to be sparse, that's L1 norm. And the second norm is you design. You add a lot of additional knowledge to design um, one norm to push, to represent the relatedness of the multiple graph. So we don't like this, so we designed something called CMU. You can tell from just the uh, method itself, that it's very, very easy and simple. We just define a graph from each context is addition of a shared component plus a context specific component. That's it. So it's very, very easy and simple formulation, but this formulation is extremely hard for maximal likelihood estimation. And the reason why previous people don't work on this formulation was because it's just very hard to solve from the maximal likelihood estimation formulation. For those of you who actually know about this very much, the, in the end, it's because the determinant gradient of the determinant of the two summation give an inverse, make it inseparable. So uh, we use instead something called climb formulation, make the whole thing uh, column parallelizable, and which, um, yeah, so support this summation formulation. And we also asymptotically, we prove the convergence rate. So compared to, you know, the baseline you compare to estimate a share plus individual, it versus you just estimate K different single tasks. So from the theoretical asymptotic uh, statistical convergence rate, you actually can prove it converges faster, which means your end estimator, it's more closer to that truth from this formulation. So there's a theoretical guarantee when you do multi-task formulation, you get a better estimator. So uh, this, there are some experiments we did on transcription factor um, co-binding from chip sick experiments across cell types, and, but I want to skip it. Then we extend it to non-paranormal uh, cases. Extremely easy to extend the CMU formulation into non-paranormal from Gaussian distribution to uh, non-paranormal distribution. The only trick you need to do is to change that covariance matrix into Candle's tau correlation matrix. You can prove it converges, it has the same convergence rate um, as before, and um, the computational cost, the only extra is the Candle's tau uh, calculation. So it's a univariate uh, function on each variable. Right, it's not univariate, not uh, uh, monotonic? It's monotonic, yes, not, yes, okay. it's, it's monotonic. Monotonic and univariate uh, function on each variable. So you can replace the Gaussian covariance matrix with something broader? Candles tau, yeah, right. so one of like the, we use candles tau. Yeah. Yeah, it's a rank-based estimator. 
extremely easy to extend everything you do Gaussian case into the non-paranormal case. In that figure I had, non-paranormal, it's a superset of uh, Gaussian. Okay, and another variation is to add additional knowledge. It's also extremely simple. The whole thing we did is adding weight matrices. So like I told you, I want to separate the graph into shared plus individual. Now I just do a weighted on the shear, weighted on the individual. And the weights, you need some design on the weights. So we just think this is extremely um, flexible, um, but yes, there are certain design you have to do uh, to design the weights, weight matrix. So um, the good thing is compared to the drawing graphical law, so is for drawing the graphical law, so whatever norm you add, you need to redesign a whole pipeline of ADMM optimization, which is extremely difficult. Actually, Swing Lee uh, and uh, a lot of people like extend the GDL formulation just by designing that new norm. Um, like, it's just extremely difficult optimization. But in this formulation, the optimization is totally the same as the CMU. And what you need to add is just a W design. So to give you a few examples about the W, you can design spatial distance into that W. It just entries. If you know who is who and closer, you just make it uh, smaller. If you think that too, it's more likely to be interact, you just make that weight smaller. That's it, because it's a weighted L1 norm, right? If you know the hubs, you can control the whole column of the weight. The note, uh, this type of hub-based information is extremely difficult in the GTL formulation, but this is pretty easy. The uh, group uh, information is also extremely easy to add through the W matrix. We have a few uh, examples how to do this. And solving the solve this is like CMU, just a linear programming. And then we have another large scale uh, extension about this even further, just like I told you, because it scales so slow. It takes like billions of years if you have 30,000 and 100 contexts. So we did a large scale um, variation based on something called the elementary estimator. So, elementary, uh, so we, we call this new estimator GEEK. GEEK is uh, 5,000 times faster, um, actually, uh, yeah, and uh, it achieves better accuracy, and also it, you know, um, considered additional knowledge is better, then there's a difference, so I want to skip it. And um, when you estimate different graph, there are a few of state-of-the-art estimator called Fuse JGL, density ratio and uh, diff climb. So ours, it's more uh, in a large scale um, perspective. And you can prove uh, the statistical convergence rate. You can also have the computational cost. So this is the computational cost among this different method. And this is the um, convergence rate. And, and we tried it on um, abide, um, bring neuroscience data, and then that's it to summarize. Thank you. Yeah.